name is Jim Meredith, and uh, I'm the proud product of Randolph County Public School System. Uh, thank you. I graduated from Grace Chapel High School in 1968, the last year it was a high school, before Eastern Randolph opened. And um, I have, my wife Beverly and I have three children. We have twins who uh, graduated from Providence Grove. Uh, Wilson and Suzanne graduated in 2011. And we have a 12-year-old who's a rising 7th grade student at NERMS. So uh, we're, we're users of the public school system here. Our families benefited from it greatly. And uh, that's why, why we're here. Um, there, uh, I think all of us are here because we're concerned about unprecedented difficulties that are, are being faced by our public school systems. And uh, we're, we're not sure, some of us are not sure what actions we can take. Uh, we're not sure necessarily what's, what's causing all the challenges. Um, some people have gone so far as to say that public education is under attack. Others say that it needs change. And uh, you uh, need to decide for yourselves, and I hope you'll get all the material, and a lot of the, the, the ideas you need to know how you can help, what you can do to support public education. Um, and we hope you'll continue to be involved. The first step to anything is showing up, and I'm pleased I would make an estimate to say we've got about 100 people who showed up tonight. I hope that uh, you have been able to sign in and give us some form of contact information for you, whether it's a cell phone number or an email address, or if you prefer a mailing uh, to, to get it in, uh, by U.S. mail, uh, leave that information on the sign-in sheets. If you've not already done that, they're still out front. Now, uh, this is a school event, so I would like to begin uh, in good public school fashion uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. So if you're able to stand, please do, and we'll join together. I pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. question. 
questions that have been submitted in advance. So I'm just going to speak a little bit about that. As most of you know, there was an email address, and it, we're going to continue to monitor it. So I hope uh, that if you have ideas or questions, that you'll continue to send them to randolpheducationforum at gmail.com. We have a Facebook page, and we hope that this is the beginning of uh, grassroots uh, program that will be uh, supported and, and work to uh, uh, improve public education here and support it and sustain it. So stay in touch. Uh, after uh, Dr. Frost uh, convenes the panel and takes those questions that have been submitted in advance, there may be a little time left. We're not sure yet. So those of you who have written questions, uh, we will collect those. And we have a couple of volunteers who I would like to step up front. And uh, if you've got questions that you've written down and want to be addressed by the panel, raise your hand. And uh, one of our volunteers will come and collect them from you. So at this point, I think the, uh, you've probably gotten tired of listening to me speak, and I'd like to uh, uh, bring our next speaker up in just a moment, Dr. June Atkinson. Uh, I've uh, plagiarized, I'm sorry, this is not original material, but I plagiarized uh, the uh, Department of Public Instruction website, and I'm going to do a brief intro introduction for you, Dr. Atkinson. Dr. Atkinson has over 35 years of experience in education. She is the first woman elected state superintendent of the public schools of North Carolina and has served in this position since August 2005. In November 2014, she was named president of the Council of Chief State School Officers. Dr. Atkinson received her bachelor's degree in business education from Radford University a master's degree in vocational and technical education from Virginia Tech, and a doctorate in educational leadership and policy from North Carolina State University. She oversees the education of almost one and a half million students in over 2,500 public schools. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Atkinson to the podium. cutting it close, leaving the office to get here on time, and I'm so glad to see people who are interested in education, whether you are a parent, uh, an educator, a citizen of this county, or a young person who will be, uh, who, are, who is a part of our public school system. One thing about education is that most of us know something about it. And as we age, I find myself in this predicament, as we age, we want to say so often, well, when I was in school, or when I was your age, and I made a pledge to myself when I was fairly young, that I would not say that to a young person or to someone who was in school. And here's the reason why. I grew up in the mountains of Virginia, and it was a tradition in my family after church to go to my grandma's house to have fried chicken and lima beans and a sliced tomatoes and homemade biscuit and the biscuits, and the list goes on. And every Sunday, one of my uncles, Claude, uh, bless his heart, he's now deceased, but my uncle Claude would say to me, well, June, what did you learn in school this week? And I would tell him. And then after I would tell him what I had learned, he would say, Well, June, when I was in school and when I was your age, I learned so and so and so and so. So I heard that so often that I decided I'm never saying that to a young person. <laughs> and I kept that promise until one summer my nephew was visiting me in Raleigh so that he could go to golf camp at NC State. Well, on the way to golf camp one morning, I said to him, well, John Robert, uh, you have finished the seventh grade. What did you learn this past year in social studies? So John Robert proceeded to tell me. 
And before I could stick the words back in my mouth, I said to him, well, John Robert, when I was in school and when I was your age, I had to memorize the names of all the presidents of the United States. Did you have to do that? And his reply was this, no, ma'am, I didn't. But you have to remember that there are a lot more presidents now <laughs> than when you were in school. So, as I think about it, when people say that, in some respects, they are saying to people that when I was in school, I learned this. And I believe it's important for you to learn that, to be a productive citizen, uh, to live and work in our society. And so as we look at some of the issues that we face in public education, one of the issues we faced is to separate fact from fiction. We know that nearly 80% of the people who live in North Carolina do not have children in school. So they do not have a first-hand experience at knowing what is happening in our schools. And when you really think about schools, we know that our schools are doing better today than they ever have in the history of North Carolina. For example, our high school graduation rate is at an all-time high. And I anticipate that when we release the results of this past year of 14-15, we will be able to continue to say that our graduation rate is at an all-time high. And we have gone from a graduation rate in 2005-2006 uh, of about 68% of our students who enter the ninth grade finish four years later to the place where last year it was almost 84%. And that figure reflects the hard work of Ashboro uh, Local Board, the Randolph County Local Board, and all of the educators in our school. But it also points out uh, that we also have a challenge, and I'll come back to that. We also know that our fourth and eighth graders who were a part of an international test called TIMS in science and math scored among the top 11 industrialized countries in the world. We also know that when we, when we think about advanced placement, that 16th, we rank 16th in the percent of seniors who took at least one advanced placement course. And we ranked 14th in the nation as to the number of seniors scoring three or higher. And what does that mean? That means that that is potentially savings for parents who send their children to four-year universities because that means that those students will get credit for those courses. We also know that using a national measure that we are in the middle of the pack when it comes to reading. And we know that we are above the pack when it comes to mathematics. So while we are doing better than we ever have, we also know that Harvard University in one of its studies said that North Carolina is among six or seven states getting the biggest bang for the money that we spend in public education. And so you have that as a backdrop of uh, that we're doing well, but we've got a lot more to do. And that takes involvement of communities in supporting education. And here are some of the issues that we face in North Carolina. Regardless of how you dice it or slice it, we know that poverty has an impact on how fast we can move students to become proficient and to do well. Uh, the General Assembly directed the Department of Public Instruction to grade our schools A, B, C, D, F. And they gave us the formula for determining how to grade schools. What we found is that 
last year, the first time that our schools were graded, that the schools receiving D's and F's are schools having 50% or more poverty in those schools. And that number includes our charter schools with 50% or more. The schools, both charters and public schools, and of course charters are public schools, those that had 50% more of the students uh, living in poverty received D's and F's. And the schools receiving the A's were the schools having a very low percent of poverty. Now the next question may be, well, it must be those teachers in those schools. Well, then when you dig deeper, you realize that some of the very best teachers we have in North Carolina are meeting and exceeding growth in, school, in schools where they have high levels of poverty. So poverty continues to be an issue in our state. And poverty also has something to do with the next big issue that we have, and that is reading success. We have enough research to fill this auditorium to show that preschool education is a major positive investment in our state. And some economists who are neutral about everything say that for every one dollar we invest in preschool education, we see a return on that investment of at least eight plus dollars. We also know that our calendar that we have, where we start school at this time in August and we end it in June, is really not in the best interest of students. Because you know what happens? When students go home to no books, when they go home to a place where they do not have uh, adults reading to them, students lose two and a half to three months of reading progress every single summer. And so when you combine that from kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, students will be typically a year behind because of the summer reading loss. And so one of the issues we have in public education is to rid ourselves of some 20th century traditions that no longer serve our students well. Now I must add this, when I graduated, with a bachelor's degree in business education, and I had to write an essay about why I had chosen teaching, I put that one of the reasons why I chose teaching was that I would have two months off in the summer. <laughs> well, even though I like those two months off in the summer, and I haven't had but just two summers in my entire life where I did have it off, I recognize that if we do the right things for kids in our state, that we would address that summer reading loss. And I am grateful to the General Assembly for giving funds to local school districts to have summer camp for students at the third grade. But we also need to address that reading loss for kindergarten, first, and second grade. And I believe that it will pay great dividends. The other issue we face in our state is getting more people interested in the teaching profession. From 2010 to this past year, our colleges and universities saw a 27% drop in the number of people entering teacher preparation programs. And I am here to say that the most important person in the life of each student is that teacher in the classroom. And we have to invest in our workforce. Can you imagine any company continuing in business decade after decade after decade without that investment in the workforce? And so a, bigger, a big issue for us, and it's one being debated in the General Assembly, is how will we show, uh, our, how we value teachers 
through an increased beginning teacher pay and pay for teachers who are experienced in the field. We need great teachers, and that is a very big challenge that we face in the future. Another big challenge we face is how will we use technology in our schools to ensure that our students can, can be ready for the 21st century. Technology in many ways is our friend. And it is important that our schools have the technology that will allow them to be more efficient and effective. Now, if I were to ask you this question, how many of you could live without one of these three items? An ATM at a bank, or your cell phone, or your laptop or your computer. Some days I think, boy, life would be great if I didn't have any of those. But the truth of the matter is that technology will allow us to do things differently that will be for the benefit of students. And let me just take one of those. We have testing in our state. We have end of grade and end of course testing. Well, one day, I, I am confident that we will be able to build assessment uh, as a part of instruction where it is not intrusive. But we've got a bridge to cross in order to get to that place. So another issue is that of technology. Another issue that uh, we face is how do, how will we have education in the future? And that, let me explain that a little bit more. I do not know whether you believe that we need to have private enterprise run all of our schools, whether companies should run schools, whether local boards should run schools, whether um, children should have choice to go to private schools. Uh, it has been declared constitutional in our state that our school, that vouchers are available to our students. What? But we have to face, because we are at a crossroads when it comes to the role of public education. Some people believe that uh, it should be a choice and that money should be available for people who homeschool, should be available for people who attend private schools. Uh, there is the notion that private enterprise can do a better job than public education can do in educating. But I encourage you to reflect about what the role of public education has been in our nation. It has been an equalizer. It is a place where people from all walks of life come together to learn and to know about others. It is a place where people, regardless of your access or regardless of your address, can get a great public education, can get a great education. So there is a theory of action underway in our state where uh, some people believe that if we hand over public education to private enterprise that it will be cheaper and that children can be educated at a higher level. There are others who believe that data are not available to support that notion, and that public education is at the is the bedrock of our society and our democracy. Sometime, North Carolina will have to make a deliberate move as to which way we will go in our state. Will we continue as citizens to support public education, or will we? move to a place 
where education is privatized. That is a huge issue that North Carolina will have to face. And it will be important to make sure that we have the facts when it comes to making those decisions. I'm optimistic. I believe in public education. Without public education, I would not be standing before you today. Without public education, most of my relatives, because we are from a blue-collar family, would not be able to be successful. I believe that public education is at the core of our democracy and that we as citizens need to reflect and figure out where we want to go with education in our state because really our economic development depends not on how we educate just a few students but how we educate all of our students. We need every student to be educated well in our state. Your Social Security depends on it. Our economic development depends on it. And our children's best interests depend on our making sure that all children, not just some, are educated well. So there are some of the issues I see. We have many challenges before us. But I continue to be a great believer in the people of North Carolina recognizing how important education is to the economic well-being of our families and our state. Thank you. and what we are doing to get the squeeze every nickel uh, 